Thanks for joining us today for worship and a message from Sagebrush Church. We're currently in a series called Pressure Point. Mark your Bible to James chapter 2 and today we'll discuss faith and works and the correlation between the two. Right now, open up your Sagebrush app to the message notes so that you're able to follow along. Before the message, let's take time to prepare our hearts and get into some worship. Everything you hope to be. This song we're about to introduce, it takes its inspiration for verse 2 from the miracle when Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. But before that miracle, Lazarus' sisters beg for Jesus to come, to heal their dying brother. But Jesus doesn't come right away. In fact, when he finally arrives, Lazarus has been dead and buried for four days. And Jesus, in his grief, weeps. The sisters are frustrated and disappointed, but here's the beautiful truth in that. In the lyric that we're gonna sing, that even when Jesus is faced with a sealed tomb, he does the unthinkable and brings life again. It's a reminder to us that there's nothing that our God cannot do and an invitation to that hope, that resurrection, and that new life that only Jesus can bring. So you sing this with us now as we learn it together. 
May I never lose the wonder Of this gospel mystery From the heavens came a Savior From the ground arose a King And every day is born in darkness And even winter yields to spring So let us speak of resurrection Even in the suffering You sing this with me you can do anything, you can do anything, my eyes will see your glory, my eyes will see your glory. You can do anything, you can do anything, my eyes will see your glory, my eyes will see your glory. As the sisters begged the Savior Come at once to Bethany For the one you love is dying But his yes was not to be As his weeping begged the question Could his friend he not have healed But he still the resurrection in the seed Cradle now a new beginning In the heart that dares believe So crucify your hesitation 
wounded expectation bring? And will you welcome resurrection? Will you crown the risen king?
Into the light of grace, just like Lazarus. Oh, you brought me back to life. And where there was dead religion, now there is living faith. All of my hope and freedom are found in Jesus' name, just like Lazarus. Oh, you brought me back to life. No longer. much for singing with us. You sounded great. You can go ahead and have a seat. Today we're continuing in our series, Pressure Point, and we'll be taking a look at what the Bible says about the intersection between faith and works in the life of a Christian. Just as scripture reminds us that without love, our actions are like noise, this next song is a great reminder of how love can inform and bring meaning to our lives. 
and the things that we do. Take a listen to this. sun goes down then this life that I've been living what does it mean now at best it all means nothing without love it all means nothing I can die with kings and queens down in history but if I don't have love it means nothing so take the old and make me new show me how to love like you cause if I don't have love it means nothing if I can't love my neighbor like I love myself if I won't move when my brother cries out for help If I'm too proud to forget before the sun goes down Then this life that I've been living, what does it mean now? At best it all means nothing Oh, with our love it all means nothing It all means nothing, Jesus. With our love, it all means nothing. I don't want to sound like a crashing symbol, and I don't want to be some empty noise. Down on my knees, Lord, I surrender. Help me to love with a love like yours. And I don't want to sound like a crashing symbol. And I don't want to be some empty noise, Lord. I'm down on my knees. Lord, I surrender. Yes, help me to love with a love like yours. And let it all mean something. Oh, I want it to all mean something. Oh, Lord, and let it all
love it all means something. I hope it all means something. If love it'll all mean something. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that the way that we live our life would be exemplary of how you lived yours. Lord, you tell us that men will all know that we are your disciples by the way that we love one another. And Lord, we are supposed to be the most loving, giving, selfless people. There's supposed to be evidence that we are who we say we are. And so, Lord, I pray in these next few moments as we open up your word that we would do some examination to see if there is enough evidence to convict us of the fact that we are truly a followers of yours. Because, Lord, we do not want to deceive ourselves in any manner, shape, or form. So, Lord, I pray that we would have great attention, that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear your truth, and that we would leave this place knowing whether or not we are who we claim to be. I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. I want to welcome everybody here today and those who are watching us on the stream and on TV. I also want to welcome those who are watching us in the different jails that we minister to, to those who are incarcerated. We're glad that you're a part of the Sagebrush family as well. Let me start off our time together by telling you a little story. There was a grandson. He went to go visit his grandfather. Grandfather was 90 years old, lived in the middle of nowhere. Well, he got there late one night. Next morning, he got up, and Grandpa had gotten up and made some eggs and some bacon, so they had breakfast together. And as they were eating the eggs and the bacon, the grandson kind of looked at the plate and kind of saw a film that was over the plate. He said, Grandpa, is this plate clean? And Grandpa looked at him and said, as clean as cold water can get it. And so he thought, all right, that makes sense to me. Well, later on, they had lunch together. They were eating hamburgers. And it appeared that on the edge of the plate, there was some of the egg that maybe they had had that morning. So he asked again. He said, Grandfather, I hate to ask you again, but are these plates clean? And Grandpa got a little irritated. He said, boy, I already told you they're as clean as cold water can get them. He said, well, all right. Well, that night we were thinking about getting some food. She said, let me go to the town, Grandpa, a few miles away, and I'll bring some dinner back to us. Grandpa thought that was a good idea. But when the grandson tried to exit to, the, to get into the car, the grandpa's dog was there barking and growling at him. He said, Grandpa, the dog won't let me by. Without missing a beat, Grandpa said, cold water, get out of the way. That's funny right there. I don't care who you are. That's hilarious. Sometimes we miss it by about that much, don't we? Well, friends, the things that we're going to talk about today, I don't want you to miss because the difference that we're talking about today is your eternal life or your eternal death. You see, there are a lot of people who go to church all across the world who claim to be followers of Jesus who aren't really followers of Jesus. And there's going to be a day that they're going to be surprised when Jesus looks at them and says, I don't know who in the world you are. So we're going through the book of James, and this is the next section of Scripture. This is what James is going to address. Remember, it's all about the behavior of a Christian. He says it's not enough to say you're a follower of Christ. There has to be evidence to prove the fact that you are who you claim to be. Let's look at it. This is James chapter 2. Verse 14, he says, What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith, but he has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, Go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. Now, when a person reads this passage of Scripture, the first thing they think is, well, I have to be a good person to go to heaven, right? Because faith isn't enough. There has to be accompanied with action. And that's what most people believe. They think when they go to heaven that they're going to be able to brag about their goodness, and their goodness is going to get them to go through the pearly gates, right? It's based on what you do rather than what Jesus did for you. There was a Reader's Digest article, true story, about a guy by the name of Bill. In the article, as I read it, it talked about how Bill had donated 100 pints of blood over the course of his life. 
Now, no doubt that's going to help a ton of people along the way, and that's a very kind act of service. But what was interesting about the article was the motivation behind why he did what he did. This is what he said. He said, when the final whistle blows and St. Peter asks, what did you do? I'll just say, well, I gave a hundred pints of blood. That ought to get me in. Friends, if Bill is counting on 100 pints of blood to get him into heaven, he's counting on the wrong blood. The blood of Jesus is what washes away our sin. You can't be good enough to get to heaven. You just can't be. Your goodness is but filthy rags. When you get to heaven, it won't be because you were good. It'll be because he was good. It won't be because of anything you've done. It'll be because of what he did for you. Friends, we are saved by grace through faith. Isn't that what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8? For it's by grace that you've been saved through faith. We say, wait a second, wait a second. We just read a passage of Scripture that faith by itself, not accompanied by action, that's not real faith either. So which is it, Todd? Are we saved through faith or are we saved through faith and actions? Sounds like these two things are contradicting each other, doesn't it? Well, not if you understand the context of what's being written. You see, when Paul writes to the church of Ephesus, he's dealing with the issue of legalism. There were people that were coming to the church and they were saying, listen, I think it's great that you put your faith in Jesus, but you also need to obey the Old Testament law. And so when Paul writes about that we're not saved by works, he's talking about the Old Testament law. You're not saved because you're circumcised. You're not saved because you obey religious holidays or have dietary restrictions. You're saved by faith in Jesus and Jesus alone. So Paul's issue is legalism. Ready for James's issue? It's laziness. It's laziness. He's got people who say, well, we believe in Jesus, so it doesn't really matter how we live our lives. See, they both use the word works, but they use it in two different ways. Paul uses the word works in regards to the Old Testament law. James uses the word works as acts of love that flow out of a person after they've given their life to Christ. Let me show you this little chart, maybe it'll clear it up for you. For Paul, he's focusing on the root of our salvation. What happens to us internally? How to know if you're a Christian. But for James, he's focusing on the fruit of your salvation, the evidence of your salvation. What happens on the outside? He's trying to help you to show that you are a Christian. And of course, Paul and James say the exact same thing. If we look at this in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, it says, it's by grace you've been saved through faith, and this isn't of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works. Now you know what that means, the Old Testament covenant, the Old Testament laws. It's not by that, right? So that nobody can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, that's acts of love, acts of service, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So we're saved by grace, through faith, to do what? To do good works. See, there were people back in this time period that were saying one thing, and then they were living their life doing the direct opposite of what they claimed. And so that's the first thing that James wants to address here. He's saying here that true faith is more than just words. Write that down if you're taking notes. He says, what good is it if a man claims to have faith, but his life doesn't back up his claims? Just because a person claims to be a Christian doesn't mean that that's true. And we know that Jesus himself in Matthew chapter 7 said there's going to be lots of people who claim to be followers of him, but he never had a relationship with them. Some of the scariest words of Scripture are found in Matthew chapter 7. Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who's in heaven. Many will say to me, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. What does that mean? I never had a relationship with you. I didn't walk with you. I didn't talk with you. I didn't do life together with you. Away from me, you evildoers. So James says there's going to be some people who claim that they have a relationship with Jesus, who claim that they follow Jesus, who never got around to actually following Jesus. And on this day of judgment, they're going to be surprised when he says, away from me, you evildoer. You see, just because you say words doesn't mean that you back those words up with action. I mean, you, anybody can claim to be anything, right? My, my, my goodness, I can claim right now to be a cow, couldn't I? I'm a cow. That's all right. I'm a cow. 
That, that's what I'm going to be. I'm a cow. So I'm going to move like a cow. I'm going to go out to the pasture. I'm going to eat grass like a cow. I'm a cow. Friends, just because I say I'm a cow doesn't make me a cow. Do you understand what I'm talking about right now? Let me try to illustrate this another way. I, I got Luke out there. Luke, where are you at? You out there? Okay, thank you, Luke. Go see if you can find a true fan. Just because somebody says they're a true fan, there should be evidence that backs up the fact that they actually are a fan. So I see you got a young lady right there. Why don't you stand up, young lady? Tell us what your name is and who you are a true fan of. What are the odds? I'm literally wearing a Taylor Swift shirt. My name's Cammie, and I'm a huge Taylor Swift fan. Oh, my goodness. You're a T-Swizzle fan. That's incredible right there. T-Swizzle. Any other Taylor Swift fans in the house? Seven of you, way up in the cheap seats. That's awesome. Way to go. She's big, I tell you. She's got seven in this house. All right, that's great. So what makes you such a big T-Swizzle fan? I just love how she was able to find her own voice, you know, step away from her father's shadows and make her own music. <laughs> you, you, you step, step away from the shadow of her father? What, I don't understand. Yes, he was a huge country star in the 90s. Her dad was a huge country star in the 90s. I, did, I didn't know that Taylor Swift's dad was a huge country star in the 90s. Did anybody know that? Okay, so let me ask you another question. What, what's your favorite T-Swift song? I know it's a little cliche, but I really like Party in the USA. <laughs> Party in the USA? Yes. That's my jam. Yes. <laughs> you put your hands up. Playing my song, butterfly fly away. Moving your head like, yeah. Shaking your hip like, yeah. I know that song. Yes. But wait, 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 wait a second. That is not a T Swift song. That's a Miley Cyrus song. And her dad was a 90s country singer named uh, Billy Ray Cyrus. You're no T Swift fan. Sit down. You're a disgrace to all Swifties everywhere, I tell you that right now. Come on, Luke, we got to have a true fan out there somewhere. Find me a true fan of something. Tell me who, okay, well, this looks like a true fan right here, I'll tell you that right now, okay. Uh, tell me who you are and what you're a fan of. I think we can all guess. Go ahead. My name is Alex, and I'm a Star Wars fan. You're a Star Wars fan. All right, uh, how, how do we know you're a Star Wars fan? I'm a fan down to my midichlorians. I have no idea what you just said, but that's impressive right there, so you're a fan. So you think you're the real deal, Mr. Stormtrooper, but we're going to find out right now. I'm going to ask you a question that every true Star Wars fan knows the answer to. Are you ready? Bring it on. Who shot first? Uh, Greedo. What? Greedo? Did you say Greedo? Yes. Did you say... Greedo. Now, every true Star Wars fan knows that George Lucas went back to episode four and re-edited it to make it appear that Greedo shot first. But any true Star Wars fan knows in the original, Han Solo shot first. You are no true Star Wars fan, Mr. Fake Stormtrooper. Get out of my sight. Do the walk of shame. I don't want to see you again. Certainly, Luke, we've got somebody out there that is a true fan. Find me a true fan. Tell us who you are and what you're a fan of. My name is Matt, and I'm a Dallas Cowboys fan. Yes. It's the first step in getting help, Matt. That's great. <laughs> So let's set a curiosity, you know, you got the jersey on and stuff, I'm sure, you know, you, what made you a Dallas Cowboy football fan? Loved him since I was a kid. My dad got me into football, and then he introduced me to the greatest team, America's team, the Dallas Cowboys. So basically, you grew up with a dad who was a Cowboy fan, so you were brainwashed as a small child, <laughs> didn't have the opportunity to ever pick a team for yourself. I feel really sorry for the abuse that you've experienced throughout the course of your life. All right, Mr. Dallas Cowboy football fan, let's see if you're the real deal or not. I'll give you an easy one. Who's the quarterback of the Dallas Cowboys? Oh, that's way too easy. Um, it's that guy that sounds like a frog when he talks, uh, Patrick Mahomes. <laughs> so you're saying, 
Why did you add the frog thing? That's what I want to know. I, I had to. I so had you're to. saying that my quarterback, Mr. Mahomey, yes. the guy who just has won two Super Bowls in the last four years, who happens to be the quarterback for the Kansas City Chiefs, friend, you are no Dallas Cowboy football fan. You do the walk of disgrace. Get out of my face. Can we have a round of applause for the three people I just abused? I appreciate that. <laughs> Do you understand the point? There needs to be evidence that you are who you claim to be. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Take a look at this. It's the best video we've ever done right there. It just brings tears to my eyes when I think about it. It's so beautiful right there. Do you understand what I'm saying? So you claim to follow Jesus. Can someone say what evidence there is that you actually follow him other than you go to church occasionally? Is there a difference in the way that you talk and treat people? Is there a difference in the way that you live your life? Is there a difference in the way that you love and put the needs of other people before yourself? James would say this, listen, if there's not much evidence that, that you claim that, about your claims, then you might be real careful. You might be deceiving yourself. You see, there's a lot of people who think that they're Christians because they prayed some little prayer at some point in time, right? They prayed some little sinner's prayer. That prayer's not even in the Bible, Friends, that prayer is a great place to start, but it's a poor place to finish. True faith is more than just our words. Let me tell you something else. True faith is more than just something you say you believe. Did you know the percentage of Americans who believe that there's a God is at 93%? Did you know that? 93% of Americans believe that there is a God. 86% of Americans believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Do you think 86% of the people who live in this country are followers of Jesus Christ? It's more than just something you say that you believe. It's more than just some head knowledge. Do you know what the percentage is of demons who believe that there's a God? It's 100%. And that's James's next point. He says, but some will say, you got faith and I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I'll show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there's one God? Well, good. Even the demons believe that and they shudder. Demons completely believe in God. They know there's a God. So why won't we see demons in heaven? Well, it's quite simple. They've never surrendered over to Jesus Christ. Why is it that people don't go to heaven? They've never surrendered. See, the issue isn't between God's will and Satan's will. It's between God's will and your will. And for those who have never really truly surrendered, who truly have never gotten around to actually following Jesus, James would say, you need to be really careful because you might think that you're something that you're not. And then he says this, true faith shows itself in action. Faith is a verb. Listen, I can say I believe that this chair, this chair is going to hold me up, but until I put my whole weight in the chair, it doesn't matter what I say. It's the same way with Jesus. You can say that you're a follower of Jesus, but if you never get around to actually following him and living for him, what good is your faith? And then he gives us a couple of examples of what true faith is. He says, was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. So he gives two examples of tremendous faith. He gives Abraham and he gives Rahab. Now you know a lot about Abraham, right? God comes to Abraham one day and says, I want you to sacrifice the promised child that you've waited your whole life for. And so without delay, Abraham takes him up to this mountain range and he gets ready to sacrifice his only son. 
It was a test. God didn't want him to kill his son, but fairness to Abraham, Abraham doesn't know that. So he takes the dagger, gets ready to plunge it into the chest of the son, and the voice of the angel tells him to stop and not to do it. And God says, now I know that you won't reserve anything from me. I know that I'm number one in your life. And so what's Abraham an example of? It's faith even when life doesn't make any sense. It's faith even when what God asks you to do doesn't make a lick of sense to you, you do it anyway. And then we have Rahab. And what was Rahab? Well, she was a prostitute. But we know from the scripture she was getting out of her prostitution. She was starting her own little business to get out of it because she had heard the one true God. Well, these two spies come into Jericho. They're checking out this fortified city. And they have an encounter with Rahab. And she's like, well, here's an opportunity for me to show my faith in God. And so she gives those spies shelter, even though the townspeople are looking to find them to kill them. So she risks her life. James says that's what true faith is. It's when you're willing to lay down your life. It's you're willing to risk your life for the things of God and for the kingdom of God. These are the two examples that he points to. He says, listen, if a person really has faith, then they'll follow God. They'll risk everything for him. So does that describe you? Is is that the desire of your heart? You'll risk everything. You'll follow him no matter what. You say, Todd, you got my attention. How do I know for certain that I'm a Christian? Well, let's take a little test, and then you can examine yourself. Because that's what the Bible says. The Bible says you should examine yourself to see if what you think about yourself is actually true. So the first thing we're going to look at is this. Have you accepted the grace of God in your life? You say, what in the world does that mean? Have you admitted that you're a sinner? Well, I think everybody here, everybody watching at home should say, oh, yeah, I've sinned. I've blown it. Okay, good. Have you repented of it? Have you gone a different direction from you? Like, I don't want to live that way anymore. I don't want to do those things anymore. Is that the desire of your heart? I know you're not going to be perfect, but is the desire of your heart to live your life for God? Do you believe that Jesus is God's son, that he died on the cross and rose again from the dead? It's good if you do, because even the demons believe that and shudder with fear, don't they? You have to commit your life over to him. Everything you are, everything you hope to be, you give it over to him. You surrender your will. To his will. You lay it all down. Have you done that? Let me give you another one. Are you growing in your relationship with God? What what does that that mean? Well, let me explain. Do you have a desire to spend time with God because you just want to be with him? How long has it been since you talked to God? And I'm not talking about when you get in a tough bind. I mean, you just have this daily walking, talking, doing life together with God kind of life. Does that, does that describe you and your life? And you just love the Word of God. You just find yourself reading the Word of God, applying the Word of God. God speaks to you through His Word. You're so very close to God. Does that describe you? Do you have a hunger for the Lord? Do you want to be in His presence? David, who was a man after God's own heart, said, One thing I ask, and this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Does that describe the desire of your heart? Because if you have other things you think are a little bit more important than that, you have every reason to question whether you truly are a follower of Christ because we're supposed to love him with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strength. Do you do that? Are you even attempting to do that? Let me give you another one. Do you have a desire to, uh, do you have, do you love Jesus more today than you loved him six months ago? Are you seeing that you're surrendering more and more over to his control How about this? Do you think about him as you go throughout your day and do you ask him for help in the decisions you make? Or do you just launch out and make decisions with no thought of him at all? Let me give you another one. Are you developing a band of brothers or sisters around you to help you grow in your relationship with God? Who's spurring you on? Who's holding you accountable to be the man of God, the woman of God that he's created you to be? Do you have anybody like that? Do you even care to have anybody like that? Let me give you another one. Are you developing a, are you using your gifts, talents, and resources to advance the kingdom of God? Tell me about your ministry. Tell me about what you're doing. Tell me about how you're leaving this world in better shape than the way that you found it. Tell me how you're leveraging your life for the kingdom of God. How you've given up the kingdom of mud and now you're living your life for the kingdom of the Lord. You're you're living your life for the king of kings and for the Lord of lords. Are you growing in your relationship with Christ? How about this one? Is your character beginning to look more and more like the character of Christ? We're supposed to be more loving, more patient, more joyful, more kind, 
Are, are, are those things in abundance in your life? And when you look at your life and you see when you gave your life to Christ and where you're at today, are you more loving than you were back there, more kind than you were back there, more patient than you were back there? Those things are called the fruit of the Spirit. That's evidence that you are who you claim to be. Is that true in your life? Let me give you another one. Are you uh, sensitive to sin to the point of repentance? There was this girl, she was at church, and at the end of the service, everybody else was heading out the door, and she was walking down, and she was crying. And the pastor at the front stopped her and said, what's going on? And she said, I'm so upset. He said, what's the matter? She, he said, she said, well, a few months ago, I gave my life to Christ. But last night, I, I spent too long uh, at this party, and I, and I was over by the punch bowl, and one drink led to another, and I, I got drunk. She said, I guess I'm not a Christian. And the pastor said a very wise thing. He said, no, I think that's an evidence that you are a Christian. She said, what do you mean? He said, before you gave your life to Jesus Christ, did you party a lot? She said, oh, yeah, it was just a way of life. He said, did it ever bother you before? She said, no. He said, but here you are. You went against the flow. You walked all the way down with tears streaming down your face. You said, I did evil in the eyes of the Lord. I need to get things right. That's evidence of the Holy Spirit of God living inside of you. So that's the question. When you blow it, when you're doing something you know you shouldn't be doing, do you feel conviction for that? Or do you just keep on having habitual sin as if nothing, that's not that big of a deal? And if that's you, you have every reason to doubt whether you truly are a follower of Jesus. Let me give you another one. Do you tell others about your faith in God? Matthew 28, 19 and 20 there's the Great Commission. That's for all of us. It's not for some of us. We're supposed to go. We're supposed to teach. We're supposed to preach. We're supposed to baptize. We're supposed to share the most important thing in our life. So how long has it been since you talked to somebody about Jesus? How long has it been since you invited somebody to church? See, we say we're followers of Jesus, but have we actually gotten around to actually following hard after Him? Here's the big question. If I put you on trial... Would there be enough evidence to convict you of what you claim to be? And if there's not, what are you going to do about it? You see, being a Christian is someone who says, whatever you want is what I want. And then when God says, this is what I want, they go and they do it. Whatever you want me to say, that's what I want to say. Whatever you want me to give up, that's what I want to give up. Whatever you want me to surrender, I will surrender it. I'm just in it for you. I want to follow you. I want to serve you. I want to love you. I want to know you. For a true Christian, you know what the goal of their life is? Is to one, he one day hear Jesus say, well done, good and faithful servant. There's going to be a day you're going to die. People are going to come to your funeral. What will they say about your life? More importantly, what will they say about your relationship with Jesus? Will there be anybody at your funeral saying, well, I wonder where he's at? I, I went to church occasionally, but I, I don't know. I mean, I hope he's in heaven. I, I, I couldn't really tell you by the way he lived his life, though. Is anybody going to say that about you? Maybe a better question to ask is this. Will there be anybody at your funeral that will say, that's the godliest person I ever met? Never met anybody who loved God more than that person. And God used that person to impact my life. I am who I am today because of their godly influence. Will there be anybody at your funeral that says that? Friends, we are in it. He is the King of kings and He is the Lord of lords and He is worthy of everything we've got. He's worthy of our very best. Do you believe that? Do you know about him or do you know him? Does he mean everything to you? And have you laid it all down before him? And if you haven't, I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that today. Let's pray. Lord, it's easy to be deceived into believing something is true of us that just simply isn't. Because there's just absolutely no evidence to back up that claim. And Lord, I know that in these next few moments, what I'm going to ask people to do is going to be difficult. 
Because it's an admission that they thought they were one thing, but then they realized because the result of your Holy Spirit that they don't know you. And that they need to give their lives to you. They need to let go and let you do what you want to do. They've been fighting you for a long, long time saying they're Christian. But the truth of the fact is, they don't know you. But today, Lord, that could change. Lord, for those of us who already know that we're not, I pray that we would understand the cost and the sacrifice that you made. We would understand that when you say that to be followers of yours, we must take up our cross, deny ourselves, and follow you. Or that we would weigh the cost. And that when we make a commitment to you, you expect us to follow through. Or the commitment isn't worth anything. So Lord, for anyone who's confused, for anyone who's unsure, for anyone who right now feels you, hears you, pounding on the door of their heart, I pray, Lord, they'd swallow their pride, they'd humble themselves before you, and they wouldn't leave this place until they've gotten their life right with you. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If that describes you, friend, we have an opportunity. Pastors are here at the very front. We're going to sing a song. We're all going to stand. We're all going to sing. And if you want to get your life right with the Lord, you say, you know what? I'm ready to surrender. I'm ready to take this seriously. I'm ready to be all in for the one who was all in for me. Then you be the first one down. Let's stand together. Let's sing. You be the first one to come and get things right with the Lord. Let's sing. On a hill far away Stood an old rugged cross, the yellow of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners are slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it so. difficult day of your life will be when you finally come to terms with yourself and who you truly are and who you truly want to be. So this is your opportunity. We're going to sing one more verse and one more chorus. If the God is pounding on your heart saying, let's get things right, don't delay another second. I'm not going to twist your arm, friends. This is your moment. This is the space we're providing. Take advantage of it and leave this place right with God. You come right now as we sing. Oh, that old rugged cross so despised by the world as a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bear it to dark Calvary. And so I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I
Heavenly Father, we thank you for those who came forward. That was hard to do. And Lord, I know that there are others who really wish they would have done it. I pray that they would go to the first step room after the service, have a conversation with us. Lord, if there's any doubt, any doubt, they need to get right with you. They need to remove that doubt. They do not want to hear you say, I don't know you. I never had a relationship with you. Lord, don't let us leave this place deceived. So I pray, Lord, for more conversations to be had. Lord, I pray for your will to be done. Lord, that we would empty ourselves of ourselves and surrender all that we are to you. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This week, take time each day to evaluate the evidence in your life that you're growing in your relationship with Christ. In which ways are you thriving? And in which ways could you grow? If you have any questions about today's message, or maybe you're ready to take the next step in your faith, give us a call or text us at 505-922-9200. We'd love to hear from you and have a team of pastors ready to take your call. Have you been thinking about joining a small group? Now is the perfect time. Growing in your relationship with the Lord becomes even more meaningful when you share that journey with others. Small groups are like a tightly knit family where you can truly connect with some amazing people. Don't miss out on an incredible opportunity to deepen your relationships. Get all the details and sign up at sagebrush.church groups. We can't wait to see you there. Did you know we have a great place for your little ones to discover Jesus in a fun and engaging way? It's called Kids Planet and it's the perfect safe haven for children to experience worship and delve into the Bible in a setting tailored just for them. Join us for our in-person services where it's our mission to make that hour the best hour of your kids' week. Make sure to grab the free Sagebrush app to access new episodes of the Kids Planet online experience. And hey, parents, we've got you covered too. You'll find valuable resources there to stay in the loop with what your kids are learning in Kids Planet, help them memorize Bible verses, and even tackle their weekly mission together. It's an amazing adventure you won't want to miss out on. We hope you enjoyed today's worship and message from Sagebrush Church. Tune in next time as we continue in our series, Pressure Point. Have a great day.